Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the house of the Lord where everyone is welcome. If you're a visitor with us today, we ask you to please take a moment to fill out one of the visitor cards. They're located in the pews and place it in the uh, offering plate. And certainly we hope that will lead to a return visit and we'll see you next week and the following week too. Um, and also take a moment to review the upcoming events at Suffolk Christian Church. Uh, one I'd like to highlight is, um, especially is the Vacation Bible School, which will be held June 23rd through June 27th. And this is a great time to bring a friend and just introduce them to what's going on at Suffolk Christian Church. Also, this Friday, we're hosting the community dinner, and Deb Munn needs some help. So if you have some time Friday afternoon and would like to come down and give her a hand, uh, she would certainly appreciate it as we uh, prepare a meal to serve the people in the community. The flowers on the altar today are in love and memory of Floyd Twyford and they're given by Judy Twyford. And uh, we have a special birthday coming up on June 11th, and that's Forrest Cathy. And Forrest is gonna turn 94 on June the 11th. So let's sing happy birthday to Forrest. <laughs> If you'd like to follow that birthday song up with a call or a card, I'm sure Forrest would certainly appreciate that. As you're able to stand, uh, please do so as we sing this song of celebration. <laughs> Please join me in a call to worship. When the day of the Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven, there came a sound like a rush of violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful people, and kindle in us the fire of your
Last week, a tragic event occurred in the city of Virginia Beach. Twelve lives were lost. And the community was filled with grief and sadness. We need to keep the families, first responders, and the community in our prayers. The pain of losing loved ones will be felt for a long time and they will need support, comfort in our community and, and hopefully time and faith in Christ will ease their pain. As a congregation, I would ask you to pause for a moment of silent prayer. Our Father, we place our faith in your plan. We ask you to be with each family as they grieve for lost loved ones. May they find comfort and peace through you. As a community and Christians, we show our support and compassion for the families affected. We place our faith in you and pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs> Beverly McGahey has our mission moment for today. Good morning. And I'm speaking to you today on behalf of the Board of Deacons with a report on our Dollars for Haiti weekly giving. But first I want to thank you so much for the way you have responded to this invitation to give. As you can see from the bulletin this morning on the back page, the total, not counting today's offering, is $1,285. So our dollars are adding up quickly. And by the way, our missions giving through the yellow envelopes is also significantly increased from last year as well. So again, thank you for your generous support for both of these mission efforts. But I want to tell you now about the Haiti dollars collected and how they're going to be put to use. First, Abigail Bilby and Diana McBride are planning to go to Haiti this summer. And they have been busily raising money for this trip on their own with our help and different fundraisers at church. And each of them will receive financial assistance from this fund. We've also been shown another way to make a difference there. Many of you were present on April 28th for Prayer Sunday when Jennifer and Josh Worrell spoke to us in the fellowship hall about how God had answered so many of their prayers on their mission trip to Africa and to Haiti. And we were all touched to hear about the home build project in Haiti where $3,000 would build, will build a cinder block home for a family that previously had no permanent place to live. And many of you that day, out of the love of your heart, gave them personal donations to help build this house. So I wanted to tell you today that the deacons have also voted to give $1,000 from this Haiti fund to this project. And that brings the total for my church at this time to $2,000. Josh and Jennifer have also been busy fundraising, and they now have collected enough to build a house and to furnish it. 
So two houses will be built in Haiti this summer, and this one that we're talking about will be built in July when Jennifer and Josh travel there with their team. This house is designated for Gladys and her two daughters. Gladys cooks for the teams when they come to Haiti and helps with the cleaning and laundry. She had previously been bypassed for the next house because she had such close ties to the supply and multiply mission there. But now it's her turn and deservedly so. So this is a dream come true for Gladys. And how wonderful for us that we can be a part of this. To God be the glory. And I want to close by reading you a note from the world's. It says, Dear Suffolk Christian Church family, the world family would like to thank you for allowing us to come to speak about our mission experiences on Prayer Sunday. Your generosity towards the Home Build Project is greatly appreciated. We would not be able to do our job as servants without the prayers and support from you. God bless you all, Josh, Jennifer, Cameron, and Chloe. We are so blessed. Let us worship God now with our tithes and offerings.
join me in a unison offertory prayer. O oh God, who has given those no name, we know how to say thank you when we receive. But now we say thank you as we give. Hear our heartfelt gratitude for all that you are and all that we have as we ask that you bless these gifts for your mission in the world. Open our hearts to your call for us to participate with you in mission. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. It's now time for the Lambs Club. And as a surprise and special treat, we have a new acting president this morning, <laughs> Deacon Vicki Wilson. All right, have a seat. Mm -mm. Come down here. Come down here. Okay, okay. Okay. Come down here. Thank you. Thank you. All right, come down here. Ready? Okay, and what does lamb stand for? Living as my Bible says. And what should you do every day? Be kind. Be kind. So something fun gets to happen on Thursday for some of us. What is it? It's the last day of school, says this fourth grade teacher. Yay! So, today we're going to read a story from the Bible called The Parable of the Good Samaritan. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along, but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn, where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits, Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. So when we have some extra time this summer, this is a list of 50 things you can do to show kindness. So take one of these, and I want you to work this summer to check them off and see how many you can do. You give one to your sister. Yep. So that we can be kind like the Good Samaritan. All right, let's pray. You hold hands. Come around here. Okay, you hold my hand. Oh, I got you. Okay, you ready? Okay, close your eyes. Dear Jesus, thank you for being so kind to us. Help me to be kind to others and to treat others the way I want to be treated. Amen.
As we call to prayer today, we want to take a moment to review our prayer list and prayer guide. And the prayer guide has a focus on our children and uh, youth ministries uh, today. And just review the, uh, the prayer list and pray for those who are in need. Uh, on the good news side, uh, Nita Wyatt has returned home. And we understand she's in good spirits, and that's certainly good news for us. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day and the blessings you bestowed on each of us. We praise and adore your holy name. Our nation is in a time of turmoil and unrest, and we ask for your understanding and guidance as we seek to serve you and others by consoling the grieving. May we do so with a kind and loving spirit and a forgiving spirit. We seek to be examples of what is good and obedient with a loving heart. Send us to do your deeds of mercy and peace, to feed the hungry, shelter the homeless, touch the sick with your healing balm, console the sorrowing, and welcome the stranger. Guide us in this time of so many tragedies in our nation and our communities. Keep us from despair when we see there is no peace in our cities, no security in our workplaces or schools. Lift our eyes toward you that we may see your face shining on us and walk in your light. Comfort with your presence those who are living in the shadow of grief, shattered by the loss of children, parents, spouses, friends, and colleagues. Give assurance to all who are missing loved ones that the living and the dead are in your care, certain of being joined again in the unbroken circle that will sing your praise forever. It is your loving and almighty name we pray. Amen. Amen.
We have the pleasure today of having uh, Reverend Skip Irby with us. And before Michael left, uh, he gave me very specific instructions on what to say about Skip. So, uh, <laughs> these are the words of Michael. The Reverend Skip Irby does not, of course, need a formal introduction to our church family. Most of us know him and his loving wife, Chris, well and have secured, uh, served side by side on many community project ministries. Skip was one of the first pastors I met after arriving here in March 1996. He has been a steadfast, steady, dear friend, colleague, and counselor ever since. I'm delighted he is able to be with you this morning, and I pray God's richest blessings on Skip, Chris, and all of you on this Lord's Day, Pentecost Sunday. I give you Skip Irby. I need a copy of that for my family. <laughs> uh, the connections are long and strong. Uh, that was, I had been here 10 years when Michael arrived and I preached his insulation sermon here. But prior to that, Bob Marr had been the interim at West End before I arrived there. And he preached the first sermon on my first Sunday there because I wanted to be in the, in the congregation and let him kind of do a charge to the congregation on that. So uh, a lot of, lot of connections here, not only with those of you who my kids grew up with your kids and all those kind of stories. And to be back to hear your great choir, I always appreciate their contribution to worship when I've been here. Um, it's a good time to be with you. But enough of the reminiscing. We're going to reminisce in scripture now. Uh, I invite you to follow, if you, if you will, on your pew Bible, page 769, from the 20th chapter of John's Gospel, verses 19 through 23. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. May the Lord bless this reading of his holy word. Let us pray. Creator God, create a message for us. Redeeming Christ, touch us with your message. Sustaining Spirit, lead us to hear your message that we may love, praise, and serve you in the living of our days. Amen. I was leaving the cemetery following a graveside service at the church I was pastoring in Westmoreland County. Struck up a conversation with a lady who was also leaving at the same time. And all of a sudden, as I was listening to her, I found I could no longer understand what she was saying. She was talking in a language I couldn't understand, and I realized, I think for the first time in my experience, I was with someone who had that gift of speaking in unknown tongues. There was no one there that had the gift of interpreting the unknown tongues, so I was a little short on that whole conversation. But she said to me, have you received the gift of the Holy Spirit? Well, I found myself trapped in what I think many of us are trapped in when we talk about the spirit is that ecstatic experience and things that go on that for many of us are outside of our experience, outside of our training. And I wondered, how, what do I say? And then, through the working of the spirit, I said, no, but I have experienced some other gifts of the spirit like kindness, gentleness, 
and occasionally self-controlled. <laughs> and we went on and had a little conversation from there. But my experience with church folks over the years has been when we get to this Pentecost Sunday, sometimes we don't know what to do with it. Um, it's about, as Acts passage, which we read together, that's a significant passage for the church. The day of Pentecost. Um, it was 50 days later that they were celebrating this, and people were gathered people from all over that area of the world. And something happened in that experience with the Spirit. And with the Spirit's appearance in that setting, we read that the disciples were able to speak in languages they had not learned. This was a gift of being able to communicate in languages of the people of the world. Because we're told that the people there understood the message in their own language. So one of the blessings of this celebration is to remember that unifying spirit that moves in our midst. That the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of God's grace and forgiveness, transcends our languages, our differences, our human barriers. And that's worth preaching. I'm not going to go but that far with that part of it today because you have probably heard that. What I'm going to is the passage that we read from John's Gospel, which the, the preacher Fred Craddock refers to as the softer side of Pentecost. When it was the evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Well, what a setting. Let me remind you that this is not the tableau we put together for the after Easter services. We do often a tableau of the Last Supper, and we talk about the dynamics there. But I've yet to find out of a church that has a tableau of disciples cowering in fear behind locked doors for the week after Easter. But that's what we read. They were too close to what had gone on. They weren't sure what was next. They were still wondering about all these reports that had not yet been verified for them about resurrection, about appearances. And they were afraid that if they owned on to whom they had been following, their fate might be the same as the one they were following. And there was Jesus then in their midst saying, peace be with you. Now, the Pentecost experience in Acts is a very robust experience. We talk about the rushing sound of the wind, the, the flames on the head. And if we're not careful, that burns in as the only image we have about getting the gift of the Spirit. But here, in John's Gospel, we have a gentler understanding. And they're both there. There's no tongues of fire. There's no talking in different languages. It's just coming to these people who are paralyzed by fear and saying to them, here is my breath. Receive the Holy Spirit. Wow. That's what I think does make this a Pentecost story. <coughs> For the Spirit is referenced to be like wind. And wind can be experienced in different ways. There is the gentle breeze that comes through in the early evening on those humid Suffolk days in which it moves at least that moist air and we feel some coolness. 
And then there's the wind that came through when the hurricanes come through. And we hear the windows rattle, the house shake, and we look, as I did in my backyard, to see the base of that great big pecan tree seem like it was moving in the ground. And it topples trees. And that's the way it is with spirit as well. There's just not one version. There's not just one way for people to experience God. This, this story in John has its background, I'm convinced, in, in, the, in Genesis with creation. When God formed Adam and Eve from the dust of the ground, then breathed into their nostrils the breath of life, and they became living beings. So between Genesis and John and Acts, we find that it's God's spirit that gives us life. If God didn't touch our lives, we would be living more like the animals, just eating and drinking and sleeping, going about the basics, comfort, gathering food, finding shelter. But because God's spirit can blow within the lives of people, we also explore the earth and the sea and the sky. We make music, we write poetry, we create art and literature, we prize beauty, intellect, and sport, and we long for meaning and for God. Having God's breath within us is what gives us life. What does that look like? Well, sometimes it means we take up on that other part of Jesus' instruction to the disciples about forgiveness. I find it interesting to note that right after Jesus says, receive the Holy Spirit, I, am a, I have arise, he says, I entrust to you the gift of forgiveness. That's what he talks about first. Are there times in your life when you wished you had received a spirit of forgiveness from someone? We need those relationships to be restored. I believe that Jesus was talking about restoring relationships with God, with one another, when he talked about God's breath gives us the gift of life. Having the spirit within means having courage to take on some tasks that we didn't think we could do. Have you ever been asked to do something you thought was above your pay grade and out of your skills experience? Did you feel comfortable with that? Sometimes the spirit not only nudges us, but kind of prods us to try some things, especially in ministry, especially in ministry. Reaching out to someone, the spirit can prompt us put our stuff in the background and reach out to someone in which a relationship has been broken to try to rebuild. It's why we also find ourselves sometimes serving people who aren't always grateful, hurting when other people suffer. The tragedy in Virginia Beach is one example that has touched many of us. Emptying our pockets for other people's children that's what I had said uh, in, the, in the first service this morning with Calvin as well. I always said once my kids got out of school, I made sure people knew I'm willing to pay taxes to educate other people's children. Giving our money for something that we don't benefit from is important, whether it's in the municipal setting or the church setting. When was the last time you felt inspired by God's spirit? Can you identify a time in which you felt that God was tugging at you in some way? Is there a time you can identify when you felt like you had some guidance, protection, and love in a very tough time because of God's Spirit? When you felt like God's Spirit gave you the courage for what was needed in an anxious situation? You've got to be careful, though, about the Holy Spirit. Whether you're inspired by the Acts dynamic version 
or the softer, gentler John's gospel version. The spirit is dangerous stuff, especially when you're open yourself to being led by the spirit. It's not about personal comfort. It's about the work of the kingdom. Jesus said you can't see the spirit. But like the wind, you can see its effect. And this is where we open the window for the Apostle Paul to speak to us. Paul gave us some specific concrete ways to behave like the Spirit is in us. You recall his fruits of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Can you check off all those? I can't all at once probably. Sometimes I'm good at one and I have to work on the others. So the question I think that's important is can we position ourselves in our daily living to be more receptive to that spirit of God? that blows through our lives. Do you know how long it takes, they say, the people who are aware of brain chemistry and neurons and synapses and all that to make a habit? Uh, some say it takes 66 days minimum. And you wonder why that habit you wanted to create didn't work for two, two days? It's because we are programmed into a lot of habits right now. God has wired us that way. God has wired us so that we can behave ourselves into believing. And we have opportunities to position our lives reflecting those fruits of the Spirit. Some days even when we don't feel like it. Because if we're going to make it a habit, we've got to do it even when it's not easy or when we don't want to. I'm sure all of you that are here every Sunday, you say, gee, I'm ready to go to church. I'm excited. I've got a better reaction from the 8, 845 people this morning. I guess you've had longer to work into the day. Uh, but I know I've preached long enough that when I look at the eyes in the sanctuary, that not everybody is there because they say, oh, I know he's going to have a word from the Lord and I'm engaged to be there and worship and praise. No, there are some Sundays when we're here because we know it's where we're supposed to be. And I've always prayed that my children will have a better image of Sunday mornings than their father saying, we've got to get ready to go to church and you're going whether you want to or not. But in order for something to take root, we've got to keep doing it. We've got to prepare the soil. And that's where Paul gives us those hints. Behaviors. You've got a great opportunity. Catch up with the, that Lambs Club group and look at their sheet for this summer. 50 things you can do. Start doing some of those. Because it takes a long time. It takes a while to get those kind of spirit habits imprinted into here and here. Because I think that's the real test. Not just experiencing God's spirit, God's breath, but being willing to be led by the spirit. It can take time. But if you yield to the Spirit and are willing to try some things that are out of your comfort zone for the sake of the kingdom, there's something very important that God will be doing in your life and through your life. It might just be as simple as this, to go somewhere and hold somebody's hand to be Jesus for somebody. For that's what Christ wants of us, not just to have us believe in him. He wants us to be people who surrender to him, who yield to him, who are willing to be led by him, to be transformed by him, the Pentecost people. 
So as you leave this special place on this special day, I only get to wear this at least for one Sunday a year. But remember this day and don't put the spirit aside till next June. Remember Jesus' experience in that upper room with his disciples. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Not peace be with you so you can just feel good and comfortable and assured. But peace be with you as the Father has sent me, so I send you. Go as people who have been sent by God, filled by the Holy Spirit, to join with God in God's mission in this world. What a gift to be Pentecost people. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for our time together of worship. We thank you for the ways in which we know you have touched our lives. Inspire us now. Let your spirit move in our lives so we can make a difference in the world for your kingdom. Touch us. Forgive us those times when we shut the door on the spirit. But rejoice with us when we open. Christ's name we pray. Amen. You are invited to stand if you are able for your hymn of commitment, number 390, Spirit of God, descend upon my heart, verses 1, 2, and 4. into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor every person that you meet. And love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit.